Tonight I wanted to talk about the Saraniya Sutta. The Saraniya means how to be remembered kindly by all people. There's six factors to the Saraniya Sutta. The first is to practice loving kindness in thought, then loving kindness in speech, loving kindness in action, to practice dana, to practice morality, and to practice wisdom. These are the six factors of the of the Saraniya Sutta. And when you practice them and use them in your daily life, you'll find that everyone is kind to you and they remember you kindly. They will you'll have a lot of surprises happen. People will write to you you haven't known in, or you haven't seen in a long time and tell you how much they think of you, things like that. So the first factor is metta and thought. And what does that really mean? Does that mean just thinking loving thoughts all the time? That's not really metta in thought. Metta in thought means to be able to lovingly accept whatever is happening to you in the present moment. It means whatever the situation is, that your mind does not have any aversion in it, that it accepts it without fighting, without being at war with yourself. So metta in thought means not pushing things away that are disagreeable, not, <laughs> not allowing your mind to judge and condemn, not trying to control situations, but learning how to lovingly be in harmony with what's happening in the present moment. This is a particular kind of skill. It's not an easy thing to do. But with practice, you can learn how to do it without too much problem. It's just a matter of remembering. And I'll explain that a little later. Just last week, there was elections here in Malaysia. And before the elections happened, how many people became very afraid that what happens this time in the election is the same thing that will happen 20 years ago in the election? How many people went out and bought extra food? How many people spent a lot of time worrying, discussing, being afraid of the consequences, not knowing what to do? being caught by all of these kind of mental states. All of these mental states are very easy to become attached to and to dislike. That means that at that time, you weren't practicing a loving acceptance of thought. That means at that time, it was reaction to all of those thoughts that came in. And the reaction that your mind happened at first was worry would come up. You don't like worry to come up, and you try to push it away. You dislike the worry. That's only natural. Fear comes up. Nobody likes to be afraid. Push it away. But the problem is, the more you push these kind of thoughts away, the stronger they become. That's a negative kind of attachment. So what to do? You can give in to these thoughts and overreact, go out and buy food because you're worried. 
you watch all of these negative mental states and identify very strongly with each one of these thoughts that come into your mind and fight it and you're at war you, you have already experienced what that's like now the elections are over and there's a little bit of relief because what you feared would happen didn't happen but there's still that attachment to all of these thoughts that you had and these will come up again in the future that's the nature of fighting with thoughts it's the nature of attachment that's real unsatisfactoriness that's real pain metta in thought means instead of focusing your mind on worry on fear on doubt on helplessness it means to focus your mind on loving kindness and how do you do that I spoke about it a little bit last week when an unsatisfactory condition arises when there's fear arises there's dissatisfaction in the mind don't let your mind just take off with it be aware enough to see that this yes it is unsatisfactory these thoughts then focus your mind on loving kindness two or three times that's all it takes loving kindness is guiding and protecting me loving kindness is guiding and protecting this situation you just have to do that two or three times your mind becomes calm centered it's no longer so attached to these negative mental states you're not fighting them anymore they can still be there but your perspective is a little different you'll be able to see more clearly what's happening in the present moment without the ego identification with i am i'm afraid I'm sad. I'm lonely. I feel helpless. After you focus on loving kindness for a few times, it makes a it brings a balance to the mind. And after that balance, even though the fear can be there, you see it for what it really is then it's an arising and it's a passing away of a thought it's not my thought it's not anyone else's thought it's just an arising and passing away of a thought you can see clearly that this arising and passing away is just part of a process when you don't fight it it goes away very quickly something else comes up and takes its place when you focus on loving kindness generally it's something nice that will come and take its place but not always there are situations that you can be in that are very difficult you have to go in and have surgery you have cancer loving kindness is not necessarily going to make the cancer go away it's not going to make the pain go away but when you focus your mind on loving kindness what it does help you to do is to have a balanced mind a calm mind a mind that accepts the situation without fighting it and sees it for what it is and one time the buddha he was a bodhisattva he was born to a queen his father was a king he was a couple of years old and his mother was playing with him the king came and talked to the mother and she didn't hear him and he became jealous and he started thinking ah uh, if this happens now what's going to happen when the when this little boy gets to be grown 
he's going to try to take the throne away from me and the mother is going to help so I'm not going to allow this I can't allow it to happen so he called his executioner and he took the boy away from the mother and he told the executioner cut off his hands the bodhisattva saw that this is definitely an unsatisfactory situation but what could he do couldn't make it he couldn't change the situation he didn't he didn't have it in his power he saw that this was a test and he could learn to practice and focus his mind on loving kindness on the four different kinds of beings he could put loving kindness to himself loving kindness to someone he loved his mother loving kindness to someone that he was neutral to the executioner loving kindness to an enemy his father he focused his mind on loving kindness the executioner cut his hands off he didn't cry he kept his mind focused on loving kindness he didn't allow his mind to dwell on the unsatisfactoriness of the situation he didn't allow his mind to to dwell on how difficult it is to bear this kind of pain he only focused his mind on loving kindness by doing this his mind stayed in harmony his mind stayed tranquil at ease because the baby didn't cry it made it made his father furious and he said cut off his legs so the executioner did that still the bodhisattva didn't cry now this is definitely a difficult situation but what a great test it is of his mind power of his focus of his keeping his mind away from allowing hatred to come in hatred of the situation hatred of the pain hatred of the person causing the pain he didn't allow that his mind was in harmony eventually the king had him had his head cut off as soon as he died he was reborn in a heavenly realm he had a mansion many the celestial nymphs and servants it was a very satisfactory situation but that's what can happen when you control what's happening in your mind when you control and try to stay in harmony even though it's a difficult situation when somebody comes up and you're at work and they're angry at you and they start being abusive what does your mind do naturally i don't like that you're upsetting my peace you're causing me dissatisfaction don't allow those kind of thoughts to arise when this difficult situation happens focus your mind on loving kindness loving kindness is guiding and protecting me loving kindness is in this situation right now and you keep your mind focused on that instead of what the person is giving you or trying to give you when your mind becomes calm when your mind becomes accepting of the present moment even though the present moment is an unacceptable situation it will change the calmness in your mind helps with the calmness in the whole area 
the anger that comes up in that person, it's like fire going against water. There's no more, there's no more conflict. There's no fire against fire. There's the calmness of mind, the coolness of mind. It takes two people to fight. When there's only one, there's no resistance, the fight goes out of it. Then it can become a, a satisfactory situation, or if it doesn't, you can walk away and still be in the present moment with a mind that's balanced, not wishing that that present moment was something other than it was. You can walk away from that situation with a mind that is happy, then unattached. So when, when you practice metta in thought, it doesn't mean that you, you... that you accept the situation without... No, I, I don't want to do it that way. Having loving, loving kindness in your mind means that situations are acceptable even though someone looking on would see it as completely unacceptable. So loving kindness in thought means an active participation on your part. It means being aware of your own thoughts, of the situation. If the situation is difficult to endure, put loving kindness into it. So any time that there's worry, dissatisfaction, helplessness, anger, any of those kind of things, criticalness, try to remember to focus on loving kindness. Now, a lot of people think, oh, you have to have a set formula for loving kindness, but you don't. Work it out for yourself, in your own mind. What makes your mind go to that loving and kind feeling? What makes that warm feeling in your heart area expand? It can be a thought of uh, something like the Buddha said. Everybody is everybody else's relative. It can be a thought like that. You're my relative. You were my mother in, in one lifetime. How can I have anger at you? That can make that loving and kind feeling come up. Or it can just be focusing on the loving kindness being in the situation. It just depends on you. Whatever pulls that warm feeling up in you, focus on it. It can be even a picture or a, a memory of a child, a baby, that you were holding, and that warm, kind feeling arose in you. That feeling you want to cultivate. You want to get so that you can pull it up any time you focus your mind on that. It takes some practice. Excuse me. But the more times you practice it, the easier it becomes, just like anything. So loving kindness and thought takes practice and it can change your outlook from dissatisfaction to harmony. 
to making the present moment something that's not desirable into something that it's all right that it's that way. This is really a fine balance, and it does take practice. It helps to sit in, in meditation and practice loving kindness because if you can take a block of time and just direct your mind to doing that and direct your mind in, and, and your heart into radiating that feeling, then it becomes easier when you're in your daily situation. Another thing that helps with loving kindness is to be very aware of your speech. Loving kindness in speech is very important. Now, what does that mean really? It means not necessarily saying something that's right. Because if you say something that's right, that means somebody else could be wrong, and that's war. It means saying something that's kind and gentle at the right time. It means watching your thoughts and not allowing your, mind, your, your mouth to run off anywhere it's going to. If you start to say something that's not kind, that's not helpful at the moment, practice your awareness so that you can stop it and then focus your mind on loving kindness, loving kindness guiding your speech and guiding your mind that helps calm your mind down and then when you have a calm mind nice things will come out the appropriate things will come out at the time that takes practice too you really have to be very much aware to practice loving kindness of speech it's real easy just to kind of forget and get into your gossip states. I understand. It happens to me occasionally. But with practice, it becomes less and less. And then you start seeing how you affect everybody around you. People become very nice. They like to be around people that are positive, that say things nice, that are kind and gentle. People will remember you a long time if you tell them about something that you like. They'll remember you and think kindly of you for years. But if you spend time telling them about something you don't like, they don't even want to be around you. Mindfulness of speech is very important. You affect the world around you either positively or negatively, depending on how much, how careful you are. It's real easy to get into states of judging and condemning, especially when, let's say, you're at home, somebody knocks on the door and it's a Christian and they want to convert you. It's real easy when you get away from them to start talking about how bad they are, how much you don't really like that. But nobody wants to hear that. You're not helping yourself. You're only creating bad feeling. And you're not being mindful, and that's the worst part. The more times you can remember to be in the present moment and speak positively, the happier your mind becomes. The happier your mind becomes, the easier it is to focus your mind on loving kindness and positive things. It's all attached. It's not separate at all. 
Loving kindness in action is another thing. A lot of people think, well, loving kindness in action just means uh, helping someone out, doing something nice in that way. But there, it's, it, there's more subtle things to it. Loving kindness in action means not only helping someone else out, but helping yourself out too. It means not watching so much television, not going to movies that scare your mind or cause negative mental states to arise. It means thinking about what you're doing before you do it and not try to do things just because you want to escape reality. Oh, I want to go to the show because I'm bored. I want to go out and buy a new, new pair of shoes because that'll make me happy because I'm not happy right now. Right action means watching what you're going to be doing. Plan it out carefully and be aware of your mind at the time. Not allowing your mind to give in to the cravings and the, the material satisfactions that's so easy to get sucked into. The material things are just like a vacuum cleaner. They just pull you in. And you have momentary happiness. And it's only momentary. Oh, I need a new pair of shoes. There's some excitement going to the store, getting a new pair of shoes. The new pair of shoes are great for about a week, two weeks, and then they're not new anymore. They're not exciting. And then your mind says, oh, I need some more excitement. Not the last time, I remember that getting a new pair of shoes made me happy, so maybe I should go buy something else. But going out and buying all of these things causes some problems. What kind of problems do you say? Well, how many hours a week do you have to work to support your car? How many hours a week do you have to work to support your new house? How many hours a week do you have to support to work to support all of the things that you want? Not that you need, but that you want. Then you wind up working, oh, I got I to need some overtime. I have to work an extra two hours today. And then you come home, well, I'm too tired. I don't feel like sitting in meditation. I don't feel like, maybe I'll just sit down in front of the TV. That's easy. All of these kind of distracting things take you away from being mindful. The Buddha talked very much on how good it is to live a simple life. To live a simple life means you don't have to work so hard to gain material possessions. It allows you much more time to spend on yourself. You can find joys in just going out for a walk that you never thought was possible before because you were too busy. You can go out for a walk and you can stop and you have time to see a spider spin a web. Your mind can become peaceful and you can become in harmony with that spider. You can give the spider loving kindness at that time too. You're developing your own mind when you do that. But when you get caught in the material things, then you don't have time. I gotta go to work, I'm in a hurry. I've gotta go see my friends because I don't have any other time to do it. I gotta go run to do that. I know, oh, and I have to go to the cleaners because these cleaners, I have to pick up my clothes. I have to do this. I have to do that. 
and you wind up wearing yourself out completely and your mind never really becomes satisfied. Your mind never really has a chance to get tranquil, to be in the present moment because you've got so many things pulling you out. Loving kindness in action means to be careful with your activities. Make sure your activities don't hurt anybody else or cause anybody else pain. Don't litter. That's a simple one. Don't use your car unless you absolutely have to. That throws a lot of stuff up in the, into the air. Causes problems for you and everyone else. Take time to be with yourself. Don't always be going out for your entertainments. Come in and watch what's happening. Try to put in here in harmony. When you can do that, then life becomes much more meaningful and easy. Material things come to you when, they need, when there's a need. You don't have to work 14 and 16 hours a day to, to support your wants. Cut your wants down to what your needs are. You need food? Okay. You need a place to stay? Okay. You need some clothing? Okay. You need medicine? That's right. But don't overdo any of these. It's nice to own your own house, but you don't have to. There's monks in, in the forest in both Burma, Sri Lanka, and Thailand, all three, that... There's monks in, in the forest in both Burma, Sri Lanka, and Thailand, all three, that they build their, their abode out of either mud or leaves or something like that, bamboo. Doesn't cost them anything to live that way. They go out on alms round. Whether it's a good place or a bad place, if it's suitable for them and they're calm, they're going to they're gonna stay in that area whether the food is good or bad. A robe can last a long period of time and it's, it's, it has many uses. You can use it for a blanket. You can use it to cover yourself to keep mosquitoes off. You can use it for warmth. You use it for modesty. Medicines. Monks don't have many needs for medicine. They don't need these modern medicines. The Buddha laid it out what monks can do for medicine. Some of it, I grant you, is kind of revolting. Some of the kind of the medicines that the Buddha said that, that a monk can use any time and get for himself. But he's not interested in the material world. A monk that lives like that has time to go for a walk in the forest, to be, to be friends with the animals in the forest. He has time to cultivate being in harmony with everything around him. When a monk starts doing that, starts practicing loving kindness, starts practicing his mental development, life becomes incredibly exciting and vital in the present moment. I don't worry about food tomorrow. No need. Why should my mind worry about that? 
I have trust that the Dhamma will take care of me. It will give me all of the needs that I require. But when you start attaching yourself to material things and your wants and giving in to your wants, then you start hoarding. You start grabbing on for more, just like happened last week before the elections. When you have a lot of things, you become attached to them, and then you're opening yourself up to have them taken away in one way or another. Somebody else can take them away or they break with something like that. But a monk who really practices, he doesn't have anything to worry about. His trust is complete and total that the Dhamma will take care of him. If you start practicing loving kindness in this way, not allowing your mind to get caught in worry and doubt, dissatisfaction, dislike, all of these things, then you start to learn to trust the Dhamma. And when you trust the Dhamma, you trust that everyone that comes around you is there to help you learn a lesson. So a person that comes around you, that every time you see them, there's anger that comes up in you, he is your teacher at that time. You learn to, to lovingly accept the lessons that he has to teach you and trust that the Dhamma will guide and protect you and that situation turns from unsatisfactory to very satisfactory. That situ situation goes beyond liking and disliking. It's in the present moment. This which pre presents itself. Focus loving kindness in the present moment and then see what the lesson is you have to learn. Almost every time the lesson is how to be in harmony. How to have patience with whatever is happening. I looked up the word patience in the dictionary and the first definition of patience is the lack of the definition of patience is the lack of hatred I thought that was a completely remarkable definition I'd never known patience to be like that but then I started thinking about it what is patience when you're impatient are you being are you liking the present moment no, you're fighting with the present moment. You're wishing the present moment was something other than it is. You're not liking it. So you're impatient. You're not patient. When you're patient, that means you accept it. You accept what's happening completely. You're in harmony. So practicing loving kindness in thought, in speech, and in action these are the first three factors of the Saraniya Sutta. And when you become skillful in practicing this, I guarantee that everyone around you will like you because your mind's in harmony. They will like that. And they will remember you very kindly. Now, there's three more factors to the Saraniya Sutta. The first one is practicing generosity, dana. That doesn't mean only practicing generosity to the Sangha. That means practicing giving as much as you can 
every day as much as you can. This is metta in action. This can be metta in speech. This can be metta in thought. This means set your mind up in an unattached way. Give in the appropriate way. There's many, many different forms of giving. Giving somebody a nice thought is a wonderful gift. Quite often, that's more important than any material gift you can give them. Now, there's, there's a few catches to the giving. There's, there's ways to give. When you start giving, before you give the gift, whatever it happens to be, cultivate a happy mind. Practice your loving kindness at that time. As you're giving the gift, give it with a happy mind. Practice your loving kindness at that time. After you've given the gift and you walk away, reflect on it with a happy mind. Now there's there's a kind of giving that, that the Buddha said if monks practice this for 12 years that they will never have need of any, any material things. They could walk through the desert with no one else around and when it was time to eat there would be food in their bowl. It's very powerful this kind of giving. They have to give every day for 12 years. They go out on Pindapat, they come back to the monastery. They give to the abbot, and they give to all the monks that are practicing sila, the monks that are practicing meditation, and any new monks. They give out of their bowl. If they don't have enough food, they go out on Pindapat again. They start over again. If they still don't have enough food, they go out again until everybody is fed and then the monk eats himself. And the catch with this is he can never allow one thought of remorse to come up in his mind. That means sometime during the day a monk can say something that's not kind. And then in the morning you go out and you go out and you think when you, when you have this food and you're ready to give, I don't really want to give to this monk because he was nasty to me. That's a thought of remorse. A monk can't allow that. After he's given the gift, he can't allow his mind to reflect on, I wish I wouldn't have given to that monk. He's not a good monk. Can't allow those kind of thoughts to come up. You practice that every day for 12 years. After that happens, then your mind is so purified that never will you go hungry. That's real powerful. There's a story in the commentaries about one monk that he went out and it was one day short of 12 years. And he gave all his food, put his food aside for a time being, left to do something. Another monk came, saw the food and ate it. And this monk came back and he saw oh, somebody took my food and thoughts of remorse he was sorry that he'd given the food he didn't gain the benefit because he allowed that one time of remorse to come into his mind when you practice giving in thoughts in speech and in actions you're purifying yourself very much it's very good to do that with monks. But if there's not a monk, don't let that stop you. 
do it with everybody around you. When you start doing that, your mind starts to tend towards wholesome things. So it's really a nice thing to do for yourself, to practice this kind of generosity. The next factor is sila. Keeping in, taking and keeping the five precepts is very important because that helps you have a mind that doesn't have any guilt arise in it. Your mind can become very peaceful and calm. If by chance you break the precepts, you don't have to allow your mind to dwell on the guilty feelings. You make a determination to do better. Take the precepts again. It's always good to take the precepts in front of a monk because monks have a lot more rules to follow, a lot more precepts. They try to keep their mind more uplifted. If there's no monk around, it doesn't matter. Take the precepts yourself. That's okay. Now the last factor is developing wisdom. When you practice loving kindness in this way, you really have an opportunity to see the true nature of your mind and body process. You get to see what the Buddha taught is real. You see everything as an arising and passing away of phenomena. Identifications. I am this. I am that. So you're seeing the selfless nature of this process. You're also seeing that the true nature of this process has some unsatisfactoriness in it, even though it can be entirely wholesomeness that's, that's arising. There's still more coming, more and more and more keeps arising and passing away. And there's, there's an unsatisfactoriness that comes up when you see that clearly. When you're practicing loving kindness in this way, you're actually practicing the Eightfold Path. You're practicing right effort. A right effort is to avoid or prevent unwholesome states from arising. Once they arise, you focus your mind on loving kindness instead of the unwholesome thought. And the other part of, of right effort is to develop wholesome thoughts. What are you doing when you, when you focus your mind on loving kindness? You're developing wholesome thoughts. So this is right effort. You're practicing right mindfulness. The function of mindfulness is to remember. To remember what? To remember to practice loving kindness. To remember to stay in the present moment with your thoughts to remember not to get caught and pulled away out of the present moment. When you focus your mind on loving kindness, you're practicing right mindfulness at that time. You're also practicing right concentration. You're not allowing your mind to waver from these thoughts. Loving kindness is in the situation right now. That is right concentration. You're practicing right speech. You're practicing right action. You're practicing right livelihood. When you practice right action, like I was talking about before, not watching so much TV, not giving in to the material plane, you are practicing right livelihood at that time too. It also means that you don't do anything that's going to cause other beings pain. And that includes driving your car when there's no need. 
just for doing it because you don't want to be bored. It means being more aware of the material plane around you. That's part of right livelihood too. It means don't cut down a tree if it doesn't need to be cut down. It means see that tree as a living thing, not just as paper. It means respect the environment. That's part of right livelihood. You're also practicing right thought. You're training your mind to be in harmony with whatever is happening in the present moment even if the present moment is unsatisfactory. And you're practicing right understanding. You're seeing that this is part of a process. This is practicing loving kindness in this way is developing and you become very wise as to ways that you can develop your own loving kindness more. You can do it in different ways that are skillful for you, but they might not necessarily work for another person. It means seeing life as a challenge to learn instead of a drudgery just to go through. So, the more often that you can remember to focus your mind on loving kindness and be skillful in using your mind, your speech, and your body, the happier your mind will become. When you really get into doing loving kindness, you can be walking down the street and for no reason at all you'll start smiling. And then you start thinking, why am I smiling? This is very peculiar. Well, if I'm going to smile, I might as well think of something nice. And then you start reflecting on something nice. And then you look around and other people are smiling too. You're affecting your world in a very positive way. You're helping the whole environment of your world to be happy. If enough people get together and practice balance and harmony of mind, it actually changes the environment into a balanced and harmonious environment. This was proved by Maharishi Maheshogi. He had a whole lot of meditators uh, transcendental meditators go to Beirut when it was really, really a lot of war was going on there. They practiced meditation two times a day for two months. They all sat at the same time every day. They sat together. After the two months, there was 50% less gunfire, 50% less beings being killed. If you practice loving kindness thought and you encourage other people to practice loving kindness thought, not by talking with them about it, but by being an example, you can affect the entire environment. This whole area, this whole city, this whole country. There's a thing that happens. It's called the hundred, hundredth monkey phenomena. And they found out, it was in the 30s, I think, the scientist went to an island and he taught two monkeys how to take coconuts and clean them and then eat them, clean them in the water, and then eat them. And they found out that it was better, and they liked that. And they started teaching other monkeys. 
And they got up to 99 monkeys that were all doing this. And they brought one more monkey in. When that one monkey figured out that it was a good thing, all the other monkeys of that species, not only on that island, but every other island around there, began doing that. The mental energy they put into learning something new that was good and helpful affected their environment to a great degree. And we can all do the same thing. The more we practice loving-kindness thoughts, the kinder our world will become. So with that, I'm going to close with one poem that I think is real appropriate. This is uh, written by a Tibetan monk, and I can't remember his name. If a man were to offer as many precious jewels as there are grains of sand along the river Ganges, such offerings would, would be no match for the limitless number of benefits derived by someone who folds their hands, cultivates an expanding heart full of loving kindness. This is very powerful if you can continually remember to do it. You'll see that your life changes for easier and better. Let's share merit for listening to the Dhamma tonight. Suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth Devas and Nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu. Does anybody have any question?